Technology, the director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, recipient of the Tyler Prize, author, author of several books, including most recently The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and oh, his most recent one, The New Climate War. Michael Mann with two N's dot net is his website. You can tweet him at Michael E. Mann with two N's. And Dr. Mann, welcome back to the program. Um, it is going to be 115 degrees in the shade here in Portland this weekend. Um, when we were, uh, Nate and Sean and I were talking about you being on the program here before, uh, before we went on the air as we were setting stuff up and getting ready, uh, Nate pointed out that back in 2019, uh, on this show, you had told us you were shocked that the Arctic was hitting 104 degrees. It's, it's 119 now in the Arctic. What is going on? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. It's good to be back with you. And that uh, Arctic temperature reading, fortunately, it isn't quite as bad as it sounds. That was a ground temperature estimate from satellites. And as you know, um, as we all know from, uh, you know, walking around in our bare feet in the summer on hot sand, uh, the ground can get much hotter than the air around it. The air temperatures uh -huh. were in the 80s, and that's bad enough. Uh, temperatures in the 80s Fahrenheit up in the Arctic. So we're seeing the warming. But as you noticed, as you noted, um, if you really want to see the devastating um, impact that climate change is already having, all you have to do is go outside uh, your door uh, because you're witnessing that in Portland. You're witnessing that in the Pacific Northwest, an unprecedented uh, heat wave that has the fingerprint of human activity, uh, human-caused climate change all over it. So the, the IPCC, the International uh, uh, or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, ha is, is preparing a new report about the state of things that I believe is going to be released next year, but a preliminary piece of it got leaked, and it, it reads like, uh, you know, apocalyptic. Uh, are, are you familiar with this? What are your thoughts on this? I am. It's, it's a draft report, and so those of us sort of in the field are always a little bit antsy in talking about these leaked draft reports because... They are drafts. They haven't yet been reviewed, and uh, there is great likelihood that there will be all sorts of comments, um, peer review comments that will be made, and the report will be revised in response to them. Uh, but here's the important thing to know about all of these reports. In a sense, there's no way that they can surprise us, or at least those of us who are in the field, because the reports are simply communicating what has been established in the peer reviewed literature. That having been said, the person on the street doesn't keep up with the peer-reviewed literature. And so when these reports come out roughly every four or five years, they really do serve an important role in updating us as to where the science is. And it is fair to say that uh, there, is, you know, there are developments um, over the last four years since the last IPCC report that do demonstrate some impacts are, are clearly appearing earlier than we would expected uh, we would have expected and one of the examples is in fact the impact that climate change is having on extreme summer weather events uh, unprecedented heat waves and droughts and wildfires and floods uh, and the climate models it turns out are a little bit behind the curve in capturing some of the real world processes that are involved and so some of our work has in fact argued that the the climate models used by the IPCC to assess the impacts of climate change may be underestimating the impact that climate change is having on these extreme summer weather events. And you're witnessing it right now in the Pacific Northwest, a, a truly unprecedented heat wave, and one for which people who live in that part of the country aren't prepared for, um, simply aren't prepared for the sorts of, of heat waves that we're used to seeing in the desert southwest. Yeah. It, yeah I, I, well, I remember, you know, hanging out in, in Phoenix, Arizona back in the 70s when they thought 101 was insanely hot. Right. <laughs> and here it's 115. Right. Um, right. the, the, uh, you and I talked about this uh, some time ago. In fact, I think we've talked about it a couple of times. The um, uh, meridial overturning ocean current. I, I'm mangling the, the phrase, <laughs> but basically the, the great conveyor belt is how I've always referred to it. This this. Yeah. flow of ocean currents that, that goes, you know, that t carries warm water from the Pacific uh, south around the, the, the southern tip of uh, Africa and then all the way up to uh, basically, uh, you know, near Greenland, um, that if that thing slows down, it's going to alter weather patterns in ways that would be terrible. Uh, they, you know, they made that movie the day after tomorrow, uh, a, 
you know, which dramatized it in ways that was uh, almost absurd, but nonetheless. Um, but I'm seeing new new reports. Uh, I got one in in, um, in my uh, Nature subscription suggesting that the this current is starting to stutter in ways that are beyond what they were expecting. What, what what's the deal there? Yeah, no, that that's right. This is another one of those examples of impacts that are playing out earlier uh, and and with a greater magnitude than the models predicted just say you know a decade ago or so in fact back in 2015 uh, my co-authors and i uh, stefan romstorf uh, from the potsdam climate institute and colleagues published an article where we demonstrated using models and paleo observations that there is this unprecedented slowdown in this very important current system the as you say the atlantic meridional overturning circulation Thank to you. use the technical term <laughs> or amoc or simply the conveyor belt that that transports warm waters into the higher latitudes of the north atlantic you dump a whole lot of fresh water into the arctic which happens uh, when you melt ice sheets like the greenland ice sheet and that fresh water freshens the upper part of the ocean that decreases the density of the surface waters that are used to sinking there. So it stops the sinking motion that drives that overturning. And what we're seeing is that that ice melt is happening earlier than we expected. And so that fresh water is coming into the North Atlantic earlier than we expected. And that current system is now slowing down earlier than we expected. Now, you know, it's not going to have the impacts portrayed in the day after tomorrow. That was a caricature of the science. But as you allude to, there are some important uh, and worrying impacts that this will have. Uh, one of them, for reasons I won't go into, if you slow down that current system, you actually cause sea level to rise even faster hmm. uh, along the eastern seaboard in the U.S. So we'll see more sea level rise. You bottle up the warm water because you're no longer exporting it to higher latitudes. And that means that there's more of that heat in the tropical Atlantic to generate unprecedented hurricanes like we've seen in recent years. And there are other impacts as well that this could have. So it's a reason for concern, and it's a reminder that uncertainty is not our friend. In many respects, as we learn more, as we observe more, we do see that things are happening faster and with greater magnitude than we expected. It isn't the end of the world, um, but it's worse than we expected, and it's more than reason to uh, take even more urgent action to address the climate crisis. Which, which brings me to my final question. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Michael Mann. Um, uh, one, literally one of the world's top climate scientists. What, you know, wh how are we doing as a planet in terms of trying to limit global warming and, and, and how, it, both in the United States and around the world, uh, you know, what's your prognosis now? I mean, we, we were talking about trying to stop all this, maybe bring it to a screeching halt at 1.5 degrees. Um, I'm seeing articles suggesting that, you know, we've shot past that threshold, have we? No, we, we haven't. If you, if you crunch the numbers, there are no physical obstacles to stabilizing the warming uh, below one and a half degrees Celsius, about three Fahrenheit, where we'll start to see the worst impacts of climate change. We're already seeing dangerous climate change at a little over one degree Celsius. It gets much worse at one and a half and even worse at two degrees. So it's not a cliff that we go off at any particular amount of warming, but it's like this dangerous highway that we're going down. And we want to get off at the earliest exit we can. The one and a half degree Celsius exit still is available to us, but we have to take dramatic action. We have to bring carbon emissions down by a factor of two in less than a decade. That's a monumental task. We're seeing some reasons for optimism now, more leadership from the United States uh, going into this next conference of the parties in Glasgow later this year, uh, COP26. There's reason to believe that we'll see meaningful ratcheting up of those Paris commitments, enough to start to get us on that path that we need to get on if we're going to avert catastrophic warming. Okay, but we've all got to work our butts off to make this happen. That's right. And, yeah. Dr. Michael Mann, thank you so much. MichaelMann.net, the website. You can tweet him at Michael E. Mann with two N's. Dr. Mann, thanks so much for dropping by. It's always great talking with you. Thank you, my friend.